Tonight we're going to have John join speak to us. He's the publisher of the Economic Dulce News, and he's going to go. We're going to start with present day and then go back. He's got he's got a lot of information on the history of this town. He's been pub publisher for what, 30 years, for 34 years, 34 years, and uh, it, this should be interesting. I'm glad to see everybody here. I thank you all for coming. And now I will turn it over to John. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bob. And uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, come and uh, talk about history and active. Glad you're here. OK, good. And thank you all for coming to hear about what I know for 34 years of the history of active. It's only. Uh, fitting that we start with today, because after 1,658 consecutive issues, this is what we have. This is what we think is state of the art. And the reason I say that is because it shows the electronic age that we live in. Right here on the front page, You'll see Vasquez tops out Jim. That happened last week. They put the roof on the gym, and we've carried numerous stories about the Vasquez High School gym before it was a canvas top, after it was a canvas top, tearing it down, and now finally $13 million Type 2 masonry steel building, seismic 4. That means when the earthquakes go here, <laughs> bring your sleeping bag and your tent because you'll be safe here. But this was history. Last week we celebrated this, and when we started in 1982, that would have been it the picture in the story. But now we have what's called a QR code right here on the front page. And for you that have iPhones or iPads and can read QR codes, you can scan that real quick and up would come the YouTube video that we did of the whole event. Dr. Woodard Mark Destasso, all the people that have voted for um, the gym, fought it through Sacramento, got the funding for it, fought the uh, people that wanted to change it, until finally it exists today. And you see if I scan that, I'll get Dr. Woodard talking about the gym, and it'll go on for 30 minutes, and you can get that just by scanning that QR code, which links to the YouTube. Now when you talk about history, this is the history. In the newspaper business, we don't look backwards. We look a week ahead at least, maybe, maybe <coughs> a year ahead, planning what parts of the history we're going to cover, what, what parts of the history we have the resources to cover, what we're going to try to convey to our paid subscribers. This is a paid publication. It's not free. We publish on the front. Each week we change what the paid circulation is. This week it's 3,054 paid subscribers. These people get the print and the electronic version, which is every single page of the print, but delivered electronically 
so that if you click a button, you can see that YouTube I just showed you on my iPhone. And our librarian, John, is going to help me demonstrate that a little bit. What happened is, I, uh, he said, are you going to use this? And I said, well, we have so much stuff already. Can I send him an email that has a link in it? And he said, yes. And he put it on the library's laptop. And he's going to lower the video projector on the screen. He's going to show what the QR code would have linked to. All of these YouTubes are up for everyone to see, free. There's no charge to view these YouTubes. And it really is history alive. It's from, we started doing them in 2007. So we have done 1,554 movies, some three hours long, some two hours long, some one hour long, some 30 minutes long, some three minutes long. But whatever they are, it's history alive. And as I said, we in the newspaper business look forward to history, whereas most people and the, hist and the term itself refers to looking backwards. And I'm going to look backwards tonight. I'm not going to overlook that. And I brought copies of the original Acton News that I'm going to distribute one to everyone so they can see <clears throat> the progress we've made from back then to now. So what you see here, John very kindly brought up the first frame of the YouTube. That's Vasquez High School. There's the gym, the big square building in the center. And that's this picture on our front page. $13 million. You all will pay for it for <coughs> as long as you pay your taxes. And uh, it will serve the kids, of course, the school, of course, but also the whole community because it is one of the selling points to get the state money for it was that it would be a building where the whole town could take refuge in a tragedy. We, we don't have that many votes, so it's hard for us to get money like other districts might get, but that was one of the selling points. So, if John, if you would push the start button. Dr. Woodard says that he has additional plans for Vasquez High School. He wants to make it a nationally ranked high school campus. Ranked in New News World Report or something like that. And he'll probably do it because for many years the people in active School board members, citizens, tried and tried to get Vasquez High School built, inhabited, and then improved. And today, the gym, finally, a Vasquez High School gym exists and probably will be totally finished in August, around August 20th. In the event of the construction of Vasquez High School, we're very happy and proud to be here today. We'll talk a little bit more about that and, and, and go through that. But if you will, uh, right now I'd like to call Sammy Dean, our ASB president, up, and we can do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. Uh, happy I am about uh, the new school and uh, being built. Uh, it's being 
more angry. So <clears throat> that happened just last week. We were able to take the movie, edit the movie, get the movie up on YouTube, grab the still black and white photos, put them in the paper, prepare the electronic version, all in color, send that out to the subscribers. And now here it is, Tuesday night. Incredible, 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 all that happened compared to when we started in 1982. Now the first issue, now I've jumped back. So now I'll jump back forward. Please ask any questions you'd like to as I'm going along. This is the 1982 issue of the Acton News. It didn't become Arcadosi until a little bit later in the history. But uh, this is a horse community. The kids are bringing apples as a Christmas present. And color at that time was expensive and a real big deal. But we thought color should be on the front page of the first issue. At this time, it was not an adjudicated publication. Now I'll explain what adjudicated publication is and a story about that in just a minute. But this was the first issue and I'm going to give you all a copy of this issue. It's the first one ever done here and uh, I'm going to pass them out. And if Bob would help me over there. I can't say it's just like yesterday, but it's like but when you see the pictures, you see the people's faces, all of a sudden, all of the stories connected with them come forward. And the prices of homes is unbelievable. How do you like that? Don't you wish you would have bought a few more? <laughs> but, but of course, it was a struggle to even buy one. At least it was for me. Yes. Fern uh, Goff, the back page, was one of our first advertisers. She uh, had the real estate office and was a great supporter of the Acton News right from day one. And as you know, a paid publication depends on support from the subscribers and the advertisers. She certainly supported us and we were able to help her sell some of those houses were all valued at under $200,000. And uh, <clears throat> right there you'll see uh, <coughs> on page three we were talking about a new market and the 49ers Saloon. At that time, that was everybody's vision and dream. And uh, a couple of guys finally did it. Bill Willard. Bill Willard, that's right. And Pete Clements is a jailer in Glendale. Yep. And those two guys got a partnership bought the property, got the financing together, and started building what is today Acton Center. They came to town and didn't really know anybody, and we befriended them and asked them if they would build a bus stop right next 
out there in front next to where the bank is, it's still there. <clears throat> because what was happening was Mike Antonovich, our supervisor, we told him that we would really like the public bus to come through Acton and pick up people that worked at Plant 42 or Edwards Air Force Base or the mall or also went to school at Palmdale High School because at that time there was no Vasquez High School. Everybody went to Palmdale. There was no Highland High School either. And so the people that lived here had to send all their children back and forth to Palmdale. And if you know about raising families, and kids are involved in sports, kids are involved in drama, cheerleading, that's a lot of back and forth trips. And so we said, Mike, could you have the public bus stop in Acton? There by the, uh, used to be a restaurant there. Stop there and pick everybody up in the morning and bring them back at night. He says, I'll do it. So Mike Antonovich got the public bus uh, to come from Palmdale in the morning about 8 o'clock, pick everybody up, and then he set the, the drop-off route to please everybody. It would go to Palmdale by Palmdale High School, also stopped by St. Mary's. Some kids went to elementary school there. Go to Plant 42, go to uh, the mall, which was just starting out, go on to Lancaster, and then at the end of the day, come back the same way. That was a great benefit for us. We wore cars out, going back and forth. And when the kids started driving, every family had to have <laughs> four or five cars, you know, just so the kids could drive back and forth. But uh, at the, in those days, it was just a, <clears throat> just a dream. And uh, there on page, what page is this? Next to the Acton Market, you see, that was part of the building that they built. The 49 ers Saloon is over here, and the market is here. There was a little market. Harvey Smith owned the little market, but it was just tiny. The post office was next to it, but it was tiny. And uh, so these guys came in, built a big market, big space for the post office, other buildings, and the 49er Saloon, who was one of our advertisers, and the market was an advertiser. And uh, that really got Acton on the map. Uh, I would like to also point out the school at that time, Mr. Smith was the superintendent, and at that time, they would write columns in the Acton News each week. And sometimes even the principals would, would write and submit. And of course, there was much smaller population. Everybody knew each other really, really well. Uh, you may remember Pete Marshall had the feed store for many years. Started, well, let's, let's say led the Acton Fire Department for many, many years with getting trucks and getting donations. And at that time, we had no fire station any. We just had Pete and volunteers, and if we had a fire, they'd be the first to arrive and wait for a truck to come from Palmdale, if they would. And so we were all very grateful to Pete and the Acton Fire Department for taking care of us that time, during that time. And uh, he had 
Marshall 5 feed store, which used to be up here on the corner, where, and I'm looking at Lynn because... Country, country club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but then he moved, then he moved to, to where Marshall 5 today is, and uh, set up shop. Uh, over in Agadosi, Rick had a feed store, and uh, he also had the Mountain High Ski Resort. Now this, <laughs> Dr. Connolly's corner here, Dr. Connolly was a veterinarian that lived here that treated racehorses. That was his specialty. Racehorses at Santa Anita, he was an expert. People would call him. And his brother would, would help him with his rounds taking care of these horses. And everyone referred to the brother as Dr. Dr. Conley's brother. For years, I didn't even know what the guy's name was. <laughs> Everybody called him Dr. Conley's brother. Oh, yeah, Dr. Conley's brother. He'll pick you up. Yeah, yeah, for years and yeah. years and years. Now, this guy here, this is Ray Henry. And Boston Henry gave a presentation to the history group uh, that we made a YouTube of. And uh, Don Henry is carrying on the father's business now that Ray has passed away. But Ray was a character. He had funny, funny stories about wells, sharing wells, getting permits for wells, testing wells. Uh, and he wrote and shared with us some of those funny, funny stories about water in Acton and Niagara City. He, it's worth it just to read those issues to, to uh, read raised stories about water. Of course, he was an early advertiser, Boston Henry, page 11. And uh, this is another very interesting guy, Gary, the auto parts baron of Acton. He brought the trailers in right where pizza, where the pizza place is, right in that area there, that Vera Tabi developed later. He had two trailers, or three, and opened up an auto parts store, which we did not have. Across this, well, let's see, down a little bit from him was Dempsey's gas station standard gas station. But Dempsey was an honorary guy. <laughs> Dempsey would, you know, you're laughing because it's the, the laugh of recognition, right? <laughs> he, he was a character. If it was 10 o'clock, he'd open up and you could get gas, no problem, till two o'clock. And then he'd lock the door and sit inside and smoke and read. And even if you're outside knocking on the window, he would not open the door. He would not sell you any gas. And there's no place to get gas anywhere else except Palmdale or Canyon Country. Interesting guy, Dempsey. He and I had lots of talks, but he basically was an, was an, an honorary man at heart in that he, he wanted to live the life, his life exactly the way he wanted it, with no interference from anybody else. But right next to him, he went in Jason's auto part. Gary's son was named Jason, so he named it Jason's auto parts. And that's the only place you could get radiator hoses, spark plugs, uh, new tires. And so he did a booing business, and he was married to Ina, 
who was a Hughes, a relative of Howard Hughes, believe it or not, and uh, actually had relatives still in Texas. And when Gary and she split, she took over the business for a while. And Gary helped build the building there on Soledad Canyon, where the uh, secondhand store yeah. is now. Sierra Highway. Sierra Highway, yeah, that's right. Soledad Sierra, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. But uh, they built that building, they fought the county, they, they cursed the county, they wanted me to write stories hating the county, and the inspectors. We had an inspector that time. Help me with the inspector's name. Everybody knew him. Uh, shoot. Ed Freeman? No, I'll have it earlier. 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 Uh, can't think of I can't think of the guy. But the guy was just new within LA County as an inspector. And we didn't have building and safety in Lancaster yet. So he came from someplace else. But he was, they put him out here where frankly nobody had paid too much attention about building permits. People just kind of built because nobody really cared at that time what, what actually was going on. But uh, Gerard, Gerard. Gerard, <laughs> Gerard was the building inspector. Guy maybe 30 I'm guessing. But uh, Gerard then started inspecting for LA County. And so we moved here in 1976 into a brand new house where the Hunsinger Turkey Ranch used to be on Country Way. We lived in Northridge went out for a Sunday drive, came up Soledad Canyon. I looked off, here's all these white turkeys. Up, up the country where were country ways, that was all turkey pens, turkeys. And there was a little sign in the front that said, lots for sale. And I dearly wanted to get out of Northridge. I looked at a lot there by the school they wanted $91,000 for a lot. I thought that was way too much money. So I came out <clears throat> where the kill barn is. That's where they used to kill the turkeys, process the turkeys. Where Ev Lundy's water company is today. And that was their office. And I went inside there and there was a guy named George sitting at a metal desk about this big. And I said, sir, uh, I saw your sign it said lots for sale. He says, yeah, yeah, we've got 15 lots for sale. And here's the plot plan. He showed me, just pasted on the wall, 15 lots, numbered, one, two. And uh, I said, wow, that's pretty Pretty neat. They're all five acres. The lots were five acres. The one I was looking at in Northridge was 600 by 600 or 400 by 400, something. That's city size. But this was five acres. And I thought, wow. I said, I'd like to, like to look. He said, sure. Sure. You go ahead. Just walk right in. It was all dirt road then. So I walked up and he had little stakes in the ground what the lot number was, and uh, I fell in love with lot four, where I live today. It had a great view of the valley. It was high enough outside of the flood area in the back, which uh, was a wash. But I liked that too. I liked the split level. It was kind of kind of neat. I thought I'd put a big garden <coughs> down below. And we'd have horses. And all my kids were really little. So I liked lot four and uh, went back down to the barn where George was. And I says, George, uh, 
How much are the lots? Oh, he says, uh, he says, we can't sell the lots yet because we don't have our license from the state. And I thought, wow, that's kind of funny. I thought LA County wouldn't have to know. He says, this is special property. <clears throat> we got to get our license from the state. And, uh, okay, well, I said, what are, what are they going to sell for? That's what I really want to know, George. What are they going to, what's the bottom line? He says, well, he says, lot four is 89.5. And I thought, wow, five acres for 89.5. I said, that's a deal. Even though I don't have the money, even though it's a great place to live, I'd love to raise my family there. Up it's probably two hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, he says eighty nine five. So I says, just a minute. My wife Gail has the checkbook in the car. Can I put a down payment? He says, well, I suppose so. I said, okay. So I went out to the car, wrote out a check <coughs> for five hundred dollars. A bad check because I didn't have, I couldn't cover it. <laughs> But I'm figuring he's not going to be cashing it for a while, so at least I can reserve my spot, right? So I take it in and I says, well, George, here's 500 to reserve lot four. How's that? Oh, that's fine. He says, thanks. That's great. You're our first sale. Your first, first sale on our new track, the, the Hunsinger brothers, who own the turkey ranch, are developing this turkey ranch like they have done in Bouquet Canyon and before that down in Reseda, Reseda Boulevard. That was their father Hunt Singer's method of providing for his family. He'd find an area, he'd raise the turkeys, process the turkeys, provide them to big companies like TRW or for their employees at Christmas time. And then he developed the property and move on. He moved to Bouquet Canyon, then he moved to here. And this he was developing now, the Acton property. So I thought, wow, this is this is gonna be great. So George took my check, he puts it in, he put it in the drawer, shut it. And uh, that was about September. So Gail and I got in the car with the kids and drove back. You know, got about our lives. And in about April of the next year, I got a call. Hello, John? Yeah. This is George. You remember me? And I didn't. I said, George. He said, yeah, you gave me that $500 check. Is it still good? And I said, yeah. And well, he says, we got our license. We can sell the lots. I says, great, great, George, great, great. In my mind, I'm thinking 500, man, that's going to wipe out my, my account, but I can cover it now. <clears throat> so I says, well, George, uh, do I have to come up with more? He says, yeah, you've got to come up with 20%. And I'm thinking, 20% times 89, man, man, <laughs> where am I going to... Where are we going to gather all that together? The Lord was smiling on me because there was a guy in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare at that time named Sal Parlato. And Sal Parlato's job was to work in what was called the media and and captioned films for the deaf division of the government. And his job was to choose films that hearing impaired people would like and then to pay to have captions put on prints. And then the prints were distributed across America and shown to deaf people 
who understood English and could <laughs> read, but could not hear the sound or the music or anything like that. That was his job. That was Sal's job. Well, I'd heard about Sal, and it just so happened that at that time I was making films in sign language down at Cal State Northridge. I met Dr. Ray Jones, head of the department, and uh, that's a, but that's a whole different story. I'm not gonna. This is acting history. But uh, long and the short of it was, I had ten sign language films that deaf people could understand without the captions. And so we were, we were cutting edge. We were way ahead of the game at that time. And Sal Parlato understood that. And he wanted to buy my films because they were popular with the deaf people already. Libraries and schools were already buying prints because they were in sign language. All the actors were signing. And it was just like German or Italian or a French movie. For the deaf people, they didn't need to read the captions. They could understand it. And, but deep in his heart, Sal wanted to buy them. So he says, John, come back here and talk to us. Give us your best sales pitch. So I went to Washington, D.C. and big office, all the people, Virginia Lewis, the chief of the whole department. <laughs> I was scared. But I showed him my films. And they had deaf people there, and the deaf people carried the day. <coughs> they said, Uncle Sam should spend money on these films for deaf people. We don't want them captured. You're going to have to carve out another area of where you can spend money on sign language films. So it happened. They bought the prints, a dozen prints of all my films. That was a lot of money. But that was the down payment for my acting house. So my prayers were answered. We moved in there and have lived happily ever after <laughs> and raised our family of eight kids and enjoyed acting tremendously from all those years. Now I get a that's how I got the house. Now, how did I get the Acton News? Well, the Acton News, the postmaster at the time was Merle Adams. She's here, you'll see here on page 14. She uh, grew up, had a house, had a still, her house is still here on Crown Valley Road, this way. She was the postmaster for many years here in Acton. She lived later, uh, when she retired from postmaster, wrote a book called Heritage Happenings. And uh, we made a DVD of it. Uh, yeah, Heritage Happenings. We made a DVD of the book. She researched that book went to the old families in the area because she knew them all, got their family photos, wrote chapter by chapter about the families from these photos, um, painstakingly wrote the book, paid to have it printed and bound, hardback, expensive, 5,000, no, 500 copies first she printed and sold them to the families and everybody interested and, and they went quickly. So then she printed another thousand. And after that she printed another thousand. And everything was researched, everything was exactly the way it happened. She went back to 1890 when a guy named R.L. Nickel started a newspaper called The Rooster. 
Lynn owns the masthead to the rooster today. She's going to give it to me or sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the rooster, R.L. Nichols did the rooster back there in 1891. But he was really a, a developer at heart because I got all the copies of the rooster, read them, and found out what his secrets were. The secrets were he wanted to sell lots in Acton and sold it at Canyon. And so he would start writing stories about engineers from Chicago coming out to Acton to survey for oil, survey for gold and silver, survey for quartz. He'd write that story and then next week he'd write another story. And he'd continue this story to, well, you, the, the readers got enthusiastic about Acton. All of a sudden Acton was a place where the buzz was happening. Property and then in the back he'd always have real estate page where lots, you could buy five acres for this, you could buy ten acres for that, thirty acres for this. <coughs> And if you go on and on and on through all of his publications, he never varied from that. He did tremendous work. He helped build the school. He <clears throat> built the, the, the town. He did have a mine. That's a whole other story, too, the rooster. But Merle Adams went back to the rooster days and wrote the history of Acton all the way up to 1954. She stopped at 1954. So all of heritage happenings, all of the major events, the way she saw them, what we did with the DVD is we copied every single page and, and put it on DVD. So you can put it in your computer and you can go through and look at that page, go to the next page. Or if you want to print out that page, you can print out that page, too, with your pictures and stuff. We thought that'd be the easiest way to do it, the best way to do it, because a hardback copy in that format today would have to sell for 35, 40 bucks. And to try to inventory a book like that, that sells 150 copies a year, it doesn't pencil out for a publisher. A publisher has too much money tied up for too long. Yes, it does sell copies, but man, 10, 15 years to deplete your inventory to the point where you have to print it again. Yeah. But a DVD in the electronic age, stool, unlimited copies now, and everybody can enjoy it. So. What happened was that uh, Merle uh, got on in years, and uh, she loved Gail, and uh, she was always sharing stories with Gail, and uh, giving her pictures that, for the newspaper, giving her little stories, tidbits. Uh, and when she died, she told her heirs that she wanted to give Gail the rights to the book, the heritage happenings. Because all the relatives were from Kansas, and they didn't know Merle, you know. They didn't know anything about acting, but she gave them the rights and the, all this stuff to Gail. <coughs> and so that's why there's a DVD today, <coughs> is because she also gave all the pictures that she'd gotten the rights to, she had the boxes of the pictures. So the Acton Agrodosi News has those original family photos that went into that book. It really is a treasure for history. Um, Merle was a great gal. She knew the family. She knew uh, what happened in Acton. And as the postmaster, she saw everybody's mail, 
she know, who knew who was getting dunning notices from the IRS. She knew who was getting a payroll check. She knew everything about everybody, but, but a, a, a great person who contributed to the history of the tremendous heritage happenings, uh, tells all about Acton from 1890. The Acton Agudosi News was a monthly publication when it first started out. What you see here is the first of a monthly publication. Stayed monthly from uh, 82 to about 84, when it became twice a month. Uh, it became more popular. We, we got more advertisers. Uh, we started looking for advertisers down in Palmdale, in Lancaster, the Canyon Country. We got them. And uh, about 1985, we started weekly. And uh, turning out a weekly publication requires a lot of attention and a lot of detail. We did, you'll, you'll notice how the type, how the type is. This, this was before computers that could, could uh, print what we call good type. This, this was a dot matrix printer. This means a little printer hooked up to a, a Mac, one of the little Mac screens, printing out these lines, strips like this, which then have to be waxed on the back and stuck on pages, stuck on big boards. And uh, a lot to it, a lot to it. But we did a weekly, and then, then one day I got a knock on the door, and uh, a guy named Louie came to my back door, and uh, he says, I want to open a bank account. I said, well, go to the bank down in Palmdale. Go to the bank in Santa Clarita and or Valencia at that time. And uh, he says, that I've been there. They want me to give them a fictitious business name statement. I said, I don't know what that is, Louie. I don't know what it is. He says, he got real mad at me. He says, you're playing with me. You're making fun of me. You think because I'm a raghead that you can be mean to me. I never heard the term raghead before. I didn't know what he was talking about. Come to find out, he'd come from Iran two months prior. He opened Acton Plaza Liquor, convenience store. He started getting checks, mostly all cash, but he got a few checks. And he wanted to deposit the checks in the bank. And he went to the bank, and the bank wanted to open the account, but they said, well, you've got to publish a fictitious business name statement in California because you're calling it Acton Plaza Liquor, which is a fictitious business name. It's not a personal name. It's not a corporate name. It's a name you made up, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, you've got to publish that. So he came to me. He says, you're a newspaper, right? I says, yeah, yeah, but I, Louis, I honestly, honestly do not know what you're talking about. But I said, I have the brains to say, I'll find out. I'll find out. You tell me what you want. So I went, went down to the Valley Press. I talked to the Markhams. And they were not so cordial. Because they knew more about the lay of the land than I knew. And they knew, they knew all about fictitious business names and legal advertising, and that being a great stream of steady revenue. But they, they did, they did uh, Miriam, the mama, the matron.
matriarch, she said, I'll explain it to you, John. And she opened up the Valley Press and she showed me what a fictitious business name state looked like. Statement looked like six point type, little. Says, you know, this person under this name is doing business at this address. This person lives here. And this was published in the Valley Press on these days. And uh, so I said, well, what do you got? <laughs> I, can anybody publish them? She said, oh, no. No, Miriam said, you've got to go to Superior Court. The judge has to judge your paper for its reliability, for its publishing of a general nature. And he has to look at your stuff, your editions, for two years. You've got to take him two years worth of stuff for him to look at. Wow. So, by 1989, well, I can't leave Louie hanging. I said, Louie, give me your thing. I picked the Valley Press. I put it in there. I got it printed for him. I brought him back the paperwork. Uh, and then he went to the bank and opened his bank account and cashed his checks. So there's Louie. Doing great. But Louie, Iranian, gave me a greater present than he realized. Because then I started investigating legal publishing and fictitious business name statements and what that really meant and what had to be done. So find out, yes, it's true, you have to get an attorney, you have to get two years of consecutive publishing. <coughs> no gaps. It has to be if you're going to be considered a weekly, every week, the judge wants to see him. You go into court, the judge wants to look at it. And the judge is saying, this isn't a church publication because there's stuff on horses, there's stuff on mines, okay? This is not an aerospace publication. There's uh, other stories in here. This is not a hobby. This is Edward Air Force Base at NASA. Health. Okay. I will judge you to be a newspaper of general circulation for Acton, Los Angeles County. Thank you, Your Honor. You go out. Now you can publish legal notices. Legal. And that's what these are. See this little type? Now, the advantage that a small paper has over the Los Angeles Times, we don't print as many copies. The Times at that time was printing over a million copies every single day. So, to put a legal notice in the Times cost $600. Because it's got to print four weeks in a row. Not daily, four weeks in a row. Whereas the Acton Aguadosi News at that time is printing 400 copies. So the cost to put his fictitious business name in here is going to be $28. That was a godsend to us because people had to drive great distances to get their stuff published. And finally, word started getting around and people would bring their stuff to us. We would print it. Word got around very fast and that really was the financial strength that the Acton News needed to continue and expand. Legal notices. Given to me by Louis, Acton Plaza Liquor. You maybe know Sam, his cousin, who uh, operates it today. Tragically, Louis worked his heart out night and day with that little convenience store. One night driving home, he <coughs> lived in uh, Santa Clarita. He went to sleep, he drove off the side of the freeway, tumbled, dead, died. Young man, 35, 
That's when Sam came over from the old country, did not know <coughs> much English at all, took over the business. Uh, Louis' wife was there and his kids, brought over the, the, the dad, the grandpa, and that family business started that way. But Louis and I were always friends, always friends from that day. I says, Louis, you told me what a raghead was. And I didn't know what a raghead was. He says, well, I'm glad I gave you something. And I thanked him over and over and over again for telling me about fictitious business name statements. And uh, after we got adjudicated, then we decided we had a revenue to where we could experiment with some things. So we started, uh, we started things like this. We started doing the graduate issue at the high school every year, <coughs> showing all of the students and all of the families. And uh, always very popular and uh, running color. Color at that time was really outrageous, the expensive, but we saved our money. Did these wonderful issues of all these kids. We still get requests for the old ones from people who've grown up and want to show their kids. We um, started doing sports, more kids involved in sports, little league, um, soccer. Uh, we started doing some color ads, which are always uh, challenging because we're so small and the advertisers usually are used to big, big uh, publications and they're used to being treated in different ways. But, and then we would do color issues on things like Acton's Women's Club fall luncheon, and uh, the RV, you know, RV sales, they're, they're used to publishing their ads in color, and so we know the color, but, but gradually it, uh, the publication expanded. We, uh, we also, during that time, uh, did is when DVDs started coming around, I got very excited because I could see a DVD is a movie and a live commentary captures music. And so our Fourth of July parade every year was full of that, full of floats and bands and horses and so we started doing the parades on DVD, and uh, we, we did several of them. And we, we did concerts when, uh, when the, uh, the band of the Golden West, the Air Force Band, thanks to Lynn, provided a concert here in town. We, we've done uh, a video of them. Two times. Yes, mm -hmm. two times, you're right. And uh, then uh, we did one on Blum Ranch. They have such a great history here. We did the Blum Ranch. We interviewed Ray and Elizabeth at their place. And they told us the story about the, the grandpa, the stone cutter, who came from Austria and cut the stone for the house that they live in and uh, showed us all their pictures and, and gave us a history of of their life here, she being Miss Acton in 1954, hmm. six, something. But anyway, that's a, that's a great DVD. They sell them over there. And then we also did, uh, we did some Acton history DVDs, chapter one and chapter two. And these, uh, were actually put together by Tina Stiebel. 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 Yes, a nurse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Cal, her husband. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, they and some of their friends researched some of the active history and got costumes that matched the history they were talking about. Gun, and then we had gunfights, we had <laughs> uh, mining tours, we had, and, and we filmed all of that and put it in DVDs. It's all accurate. And uh, they were fun, fun to do. Um, the uh, biggest fear starting a newspaper to me was where do I get the news? How do I get the news? Where, where is the news? Come to find out after earning all this platinum, that's the least worry of all of the newspaper problems. That's the least worry. Every single person is full of news. Every single person is a story. Every single person. Doesn't matter what, where or who or anything. That's a story worth telling. It's the least of all the problems in news business. The challenge is to get the people to share with you. To share their story. To let you write about it. Over the years, we've had great people do that. We've had great people share their lives, share their stories. Uh, we, and I, I, I guess I go out on a limb saying the next statement, but we've never been sued for libel. Some newspapers are, spend their life fighting libel suits because people are mad at them for telling fibs or stretching truths or something. We never have. We've been at it 34 years. We never have. We've had people threaten to kill us, call us on the phone and say, that roofer that did my roof was terrible. He took my money and my roof leaked. And I want you to write about it. And we say, well, take him to court. Don't read it to the newspaper because there may be other things, you know. Or my electrician wired my house and uh, all the fuses blew. The breakers tripped. I want you to blackball that guy from this whole town. And we say, yeah, but wait a minute. We don't know that story. That's, that's why we pay judges down. Tom Dale, I can file a small claims action and go down there. Don't bring it here. Well, you SOB, you're friends with him and you won't write about him. That's happened over and over again, but we've never been sued for libel because we've tried to tell the truth every week. We've tried to find things that are of general interest to everyone. We've tried to write stories that were contemporary. We've seen stories like the high-speed rail come through town now, you know, it's a hot topic. But the active news can Agbadilsi News can write all these different opinions, but we can also look at the political structure. We can talk to the politicians. They're always willing to talk to us, give us their insight. We can see if it's, if it's going to happen or not. We can see the future because we're recording history by looking forward. And uh, I thank you all for coming and sitting through this tonight. If you have any questions, of course, I'll be happy to answer them. I have lots and lots and lots of stories, but I think you kind of get the gist of what the Acton Agredosi News is all about. And it's not just about me. I, I stand up here and talk, but Gail Joyce, is the soul of the publication even today. And while I'm the publisher, she's the president of our company. So you know who wins the arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
I used to read it all the time. It was yes. A beautiful thing. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yes, it was popular. Our kids went there, high school, and they needed football programs. And <laughs> they volunteered me. And so we tried to do a good football program. And uh, it got quite popular. But along with popularity comes the other side of people who have a different opinion. But nonetheless, while well, our kids went there, we did publish the spirit. And we got lots of contributors uh, from the school, from other parents. Uh, very popular publication. Steve Haggerty was the coach uh, during the last part of it. He won five consecutive CIF championships after many, many years of school had not won a game. You know, we were the doormats, but he came and he whipped the team into shape and, and uh, made a plus out of a minus. A popular publication, we did that. <coughs> Catholic high school, the parents have to, <laughs> have to donate time, money, whatever. And so we made our donation by doing the spirit football program. Did you learn going to the in this meeting, if you have any more questions for John, he, I'm sure he wouldn't mind answering them. Um, so I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight. It's been fun and very interesting. I thank you again. And that's it. Thank you all. Okay, so here's a photo of the Acton probably when. I believe it's before 1887 because the Acton Co-op is not here. Here's the Acton train station over there. Okay. And this is the trestle. It's still there. Uh -huh. It's uh, concrete now. Acton Hardware would be right about where that tree is. Okay. And snow on the ground a little bit. And you can see the steam engine off in the distance going yeah. towards the Liso. And so now where would our <coughs> Acton Aquadulce News be? Right about there. Perfect. Because the, later on, the, cap, the Acton Co-op was built right next door to where you are now. That's okay. the original building that they're using for that clinic. Mm. It used to be two-story. Mm -hmm. The second floor burned down in 1956. They saved the bottom. But that's it. Wow. Isn't that a great old photo? Don Milburn found this at some of his mom's. Oh, okay. Oh, mm-hmm. She contributed to uh, Merle's book. Mm -hmm. Some pictures. Yeah, he's got, uh, he's still got, a, he's finding stuff all the time. He found these, a handful of these pictures, uh, a book of railroad stuff his mom had. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. He shared them with us. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. Good.